Section 27 of the Heroines of History. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 1. Virtue may be assailed, but never hurt, surprised by unjust force, but not enthralled. Yet even that which mischief meant most harm shall in the happy trial prove most glory. Milton. The character of no woman whose name figures in the past has excited more discussion than that of Mary, Queen of Scots. From her day to this, countless volumes have been published in bitter accusation, or in defense of her, or with a professed attempt at impartiality. All the long-entailed disputes of royal families, the unforgiving pride of three great nations, and the endless conflict of religious parties have contributed to prolong the agitation of this question, whether she was guilty or not of the iniquities charged upon her. But the world has more generally taken a favorable view of her character in proportion as prejudices have worn away, and the causes of controversy have been removed. To exculpate her now, it is enough to know that there is no positive evidence against her, and that her enemies had every unworthy motive to misrepresent the facts, and that her whole spirit to the last hour of her unfortunate life was evidently that of a pure and noble-hearted woman. Scotland, in common with Europe, was still emerging from the barbarism of the Middle Ages when Mary acted her part in the scene of human affairs. She was born in the palace of Linlithgow on the 7th of December, 1542, a remarkable year inasmuch as it was precisely a half-century after the discovery of America, and just a quarter of a century after the first act of Luther's Reformation. It was also very nearly one hundred years subsequent to the invention of the art of printing with separate types. These three events smote the dead calm of man's intellect into increasing commotion, and set forward the world in a rapid tide of progress. At the period of Mary's birth, Scotland was in the fiercest struggle of that Protestantism which developed itself more sternly there than elsewhere, and was likewise passing through the most sanguinary conflicts of the feudal barons and clans with each other, and with a centralizing royalty. In no other country were internal broils so severe and protracted. The advantage of mountain fastness, the small number of nobles, the lack of large towns, and the division of the nation into great kindreds or tribes were a few of the causes of the state of things. Besides the kingdom was a bone of contention between the English crown, which labored to unite the Scottish with its own, and the French, who adroitly played off the latter in their wars with the former. Into such a furious sea of changes was Mary thrown, nor is her nature the less beautiful for the contrast of so fair a flower with the dark billows on which it was helplessly tossed. Her father was James V of Scotland, and her mother was Mary of Lorraine, daughter to the Duke of Guise of France. Both were strong and cultivated in mind and of energetic character. Commerce and agriculture had made little progress in this wild northern country. The wealthy in common with the poorest classes were without education. Edinburgh was not as now the Athens of the North, and traditionary songs and legends were almost the only literature of the people. King James was himself a poet, and encouraged learning and art in various ways directly, as well as indirectly, by the ingress of foreigners, consequent of his alliance with France, that is now the center of refinement. In personal beauty, valor, and accomplishments, he was worthy of such a daughter as Mary, tall and muscular in figure, fair-haired, of regular features, bright gray eyes, and sweet voice, his presence was both commanding and winning, and his death was brave and graceful like his life. Repulsed by the English army, and suspecting treachery in his own officers, he was yet cheerful in his last hour. Before he expired, he smiled upon the assembled noblemen, and gave them his hand to kiss. Mary was only seven days old when her father died and neither of them ever saw the other. The nation was immediately distracted with troubles connected with the choice of a regent to govern during her infancy. James Hamilton, Earl of Auden, of royal blood, was finally chosen. With him, Henry the Eighth of England, a Protestant, negotiated a marriage between his son Edward and the infant Mary. The treaty was soon broken up by her mother and Cardinal Baton, the leader of the Catholic party, who knew that if fulfilled, it would destroy the influence of their church, and of the house of Guise, 
and tend to make Scotland an English province. The cardinal in this affair made a tool of the Earl of Lennox, who, disappointed in his expected reward the regent's office, instigated King Henry to send an avenging army which, however, after plundering Edinburgh, retired home. The earl was obliged by his part in this movement to escape into England, where in token of his services Lady Margaret Douglas, niece of the king, was given him in marriage. To them was born Darnley, afterwards so conspicuous as the husband of our heroine, and the father of James I of England. Thus, the failure of the Earl of Lennox led to indirect success, and gave him the proud distinction of being an ancestor of the first sovereign, and of many succeeding ones, after the union of the crowns of Scotland and England. Soon after these events, the English king and his enemies, Cardinal Bayton of Scotland and Francis I of France, were one after another numbered with the dead. But the rivalries of the three nations continued none the less. The English regent pursued the same policy of forcing the Scotch to comply with arbitrary demands, and defeated them in the Battle of Pinky, slaying eight thousand of their men. The Scotch applied for aid to Henry II of France, and bartered their young Queen Mary to his infant son, the Dauphin Francis, agreeing to send her to the French court to be educated. The same fleet that brought six thousand Frenchmen to assist their country in its wars carried her away from her native shores. She was now six years of age, and hitherto had been the unconscious object of national homage and contention. When nine months old she had been crowned in the presence of nobles and foreign ambassadors at a place famous for its beauty and associations, Stirling Castle. The English ambassador beheld her disrobed, that he might satisfy his king, whose plans depended on her union with his son Edward. The officer reported her to be as goodly a child as he ever saw. She remained another year in the care of her nurse Janet Sinclair at her birthplace, the Palace of Linlithgow, situated on the margin of a small lake and now in ruins. Here she had the smallpox, which, however, left no marks to disfigure her beauty in after years. For safer keeping, she spent the next two years at Stirling Castle, and then, for the same reason, was removed to Ickmahom, a small island in the lake of Monteith one of the gems that are hidden in the once inaccessible highlands of Scotland. Linlithgow, Stirling, and Monteith all lie at about equal distance in a northwest direction from Edinburgh. Four children of rank, each bearing the name of Mary, were her playmates and fellow students in this wild island home, and afterwards the same number of the same name were retained when one after another of the four Marys ceased to be a companion of the Queen. Attended by these, and the Lords Erskine and Livingston, and her three brothers, she sailed from Dumbarton on the west coast of the kingdom in July 1548. After a stormy voyage of two weeks, the precious child arrived safely in France, there to spend thirteen years of happiness as exquisite as the misery that followed it. Never was a life more singleized by transition from the height of honor and pleasure to the depth of humiliation and woe. By order of the king, Mary's reception and journey to the palace of St. Germain were royally magnificent, and the prisons of every town she passed were thrown open, as if the liberation of the king's criminals were a favor for which the people should be grateful to the young queen in honor of whom the act was done. Arrived at the palace and duly complimented with festivities, she was soon sent with the king's daughters to a convent for education. Here she evinced great aptitude for learning, but even at her tender age manifested such a growing fondness for cloister life that her royal friends and princely relatives at the end of two years took her away and introduced her to all the dazzling pomp of courtly life, fearing lest she might acquire an incurable love of religious solitude, take the nun's veil, and defeat their ambitious hopes. Such thus far, and during all her years, were the kind and amount of interest that centered in a playful, innocent child, no different from a multitude of others, except in the accident of birth. The eyes of Europe were fixed upon her, as if her sunny ringlets covered the wisdom of a Charlemagne, and in her dimpled arms slept the strength of a Charles Martel. Grave counselors made her the theme of deep study. Kings were sleepless in their anxiety. 
Nations were embattled and blood flowed freely, all for the sake of a little helpless girl. Yet in the walls of Stirling, on the island of Ickmahome, beneath the roof of the convent, and in the regal gardens of Fontainebleau, she prattled and romped and slept, as sweetly as if only a peasant's humble life awaited her. It was fortunate for Mary to pass her youth in France. The court and people were not then, as since, eminently licentious. The king and his favorites were outwardly correct. His sister, the Princess Margaret, exercised a highly moral influence, and the queen, Catherine de Medicis, a woman of great talents, had not yet developed her unenviable character. Everything tended to the cultivation of religious and delicate feeling in the young mind entrusted to their care. Nothing indeed would seem more mutually beneficial than the intercourse of the Scotch and French nations. The former by nature have a surplus of conscience, and the latter appear to have a native lack of that endowment. And at the period in view, something of the ignorance, religious severity, and iron inflexibility that characterize the one people could be well exchanged for something of the refinement, elasticity, and joyous grace of the other. It was the era of fresh intellectual life in France. Its systems of education had just been grandly enlarged. All branches of science were gratuitously taught by professors who were supported by government, and many men of genius and celebrity adorned the various departments of authorship. The most noted of these were selected as instructors of Mary and her companions, in addition to the two teachers who had accompanied her from her native land. She became familiar with Latin and Italian, and could write and speak the French with elegance before she was ten years old. And poetry then as ever had for her a peculiar charm. In rhetoric she was taught by Fauché, in history by Pasquier, and in poetry by Rosnard all of them names well known in the annals of literature. In the accomplishments of ingenuity she excelled, particularly in embroidery and the inventing of devices and mottos, which were very fashionable at that day. Her loving remembrance of her convent home was testified to by the present of a richly worked altar cloth from her hands. Some of the devices which her fancy produced have been preserved. When her first husband died, she had a seal representing a branch of a licorice tree, of which the root only is sweet, and beneath the branch a motto in Latin signifying, The earth covers my sweet. On her trapping she embroidered a French sentence meaning, My end is my beginning, a thought that all persons, the obscure no less than the great, and the suffering as well as the fortunate would do well to keep in mind. By her orders also a medal was made, with the image of a wrecked ship and the words in Latin, nothing unless erect, teaching the value of uprightness. That physical development without which mental activity is almost a curse was not forgotten in the education of the Queen of Scots. Lively recreations and vigorous exercises gave her that flow of spirits which is the essence of health, and thus that health which is the life of life rendering it something else than living death. Particularly did the exercises of dancing and riding exalt her naturally fine figure and movements to the height of graceful freedom. Her excellent performance of the stately minuet may be still recorded to her honor, and all the more so in view of the indecent waltz polka and Scottish of later times. The romantic but cruel amusement of stag-hunting fascinated her with the joy of a bounding chase through the forest, and although thrown from her horse on one occasion, and nearly trampled down, she mounted and gaily sped forward again. Thus she nourished the royal power and beauty of the human frame, prepared herself for healthy thought, and brave action in the duties of life. In 1550, our heroine's mother, the Dowager Mary of Guise, came from Scotland to see her child, on whom two years since their separation, and eight years of age, had shed bloom and wisdom. Overcome at the sight of her daughter's expanding loveliness, she wept tears of joy. She persuaded the king to secure her the regency of Scotland, and returned thither destined never to look upon her beautiful and ill-fated child again. At this period, too, came from Mary's native land the accomplished James Melville to act as her page of honor. 
he was a few years older than herself. He subsequently acted often as her ambassador and figured much in the events of the time. Surrounded by instructors, the young queen and the king's daughter spent several hours every day with Catherine de Medicis. And so devoted was Mary to this woman's brilliant society that excited jealousy rather than affection. She would not believe the child's assertion that she loved to gain wisdom from her and her distinguished visitors, nor would she respond to the trustful love of her future daughter-in-law. Jealous, doubtless of Mary's superiority over her own daughters, she even endeavored, in common with those in France who envied the elevation of the House of Guise, and those in Scotland who deprecated the reign of a French Catholic influence, to defeat the proposed marriage with her son Francis. Whether instigated by an interested party, or by his own mistaken zeal for his country, a Scotch archer in the king's guards attempted to poison the youthful queen. These circumstances only hastened a union, which was at least a providential solace of recollection to Mary during her after years of trouble. The machinations of even the powerful Montmorency and the family of Bourbon could not swerve the king from his purpose to strengthen his power in Scotland as speedily as possible, nor sever the two hearts that already clung to each other. Francis was slender in health and diffident, yet kind and affectionate in disposition, and Mary, though strong and spirited, had grown up in his companionship, always regarding him as her husband-elect, in a spirit of cheerful compliance with the arrangement made, and probably mingling compassion with her responsive tenderness. The marriage was solemnized on the 24th of April, 1558, at the Church of Notre Dame. The month previous, commissioners had arrived from Scotland, who negotiated the important conditions of the Union in view of every contingency, which provisions, however it is affirmed, Henry the Second was prepared to evade so as to unite the Scotch and French crowns at all events. The wedding party on the bridal morning were assembled at the palace of the archbishop, the bride being dressed in a jeweled white robe with a long train borne by girls after the humor of the time. There is endless evidence that her reputation for uncommon beauty was something more than flattery. Her form was full and tall, her hair a sunny brown, and falling in luxurious ringlets, her face clear and softly outlined, with a Grecian nose, lovely lips, and chestnut eyes, and her delicate hands as they waved in gesture, or glided over the strings of a lute when she sang sweetly, through the court poets into spasms of admiration. From the bishop's palace the royal company marched through a temporary covered way, lined with gold-embroidered purple velvet, into the stupendous church, the Pope's Nuncio, proceeding with a gold cross, the bridegroom following, then the king and the bride. Passing through the church, they appeared on a platform at the door, in sight of an immense throng, seated in an amphitheater built for the occasion. Here the ring was given and a benediction pronounced when they returned to the choir of the cathedral where high mass was performed. After a feast and ball at the bishop's house, the party adjourned to the Tournelle Palace to enjoy such amusements as beholding artificial horses, richly comparisoned and bearing children of rank, move by internal machinery through the halls, and superb barges pass on indoor lakes, and rode by a single youth who thus carried off from the crowd his lady love. The celebration continued fifteen days, and was closed by a grand tournament. During all these spectacles Mary was as much a wonder of loveliness to all who saw her, as she was not long before, when bearing a torch in an evening procession, and looking unearthly radiant in the wild light shed down on her features, she was asked by a woman in the crowd if she were indeed an angel. In Scotland the marriage was honored among other ways by bonfires, and by firing the famous gigantic gun called Mons Meg, which is still to be seen. The bride and groom retired into the country, after the ceremonies to enjoy the quiet that was especially grateful to the shrinking nature of Francis. Here Mary showed herself as eminent in the affectionate duties of a wife as she had been in the splendors of the court. But the freedom of rural life was not long the privilege of these two amiable beings. Cares and griefs were near at hand. The first interruption of their quietude was the death of the king. Henry the Second. 
at a tournament given in honor of his sister's and eldest daughter's marriages, he himself entered the lists in all the pride of his strength, courage, and regal array. But, by one of the accidents that sometimes happened in that warlike diversion, a lance pierced his helmet, inflicting a wound from which he died a few days after. Francis, ill at the time, sprang from his bed, assumed the scepter, and was crowned at Reims, September 1559. Mary was now queen of both France and Scotland, and through the influence of her friends unwisely paraded a title to the English crown also. The young Edward the Sixth, to whom she was once engaged, and his sister Mary, known as the Bloody, had successively worn that crown and died, leaving it to the famous Elizabeth, who was first cousin to the father of Mary, Queen of Scots. The title of the latter to this, a third throne, was urged on the ground of Elizabeth's illegitimacy, which had been first decreed and afterwards denied by Acts of Parliament, the question being whether the divorce of her mother, Anne Boleyn, rendered the daughter a rightful heir to royalty or not. The death of Elizabeth would, without dispute, have given Mary a triple scepter, and she was right in refusing, as she did, most firmly and ably for one so young, to relinquish such a rich reversion. As it was, her plate, banners, seals, furniture, all bore the united arms of Scotland, France, and England, and her chosen device was the crowns of the two first, with the words in Latin, another is delayed, or awaits me. Provoking as was this to the high temper of England's maiden sovereign, it fitly signified our heroine's peerless position before the eyes of a continent. She stood in the glory of youth and beauty, at the head of two of its greatest kingdoms, and claimed headship over another. The then as now most splendid empires of Europe were hers in possession or expectancy. But even in the first full blaze of her fortune she did not lose her sweet humility and magnanimity. In the coronation procession she yielded her own rightful precedence to her always ungracious and now discrowned and frowning mother-in-law. End of section 27. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Twenty-eight of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part Two. Francis, notwithstanding his feeble constitution and his title of the Little to distinguish him invidiously from Francis the Great entered on his duties with much energy, but his health declined, and after a reign of seventeen months he died, expressing to the last his love for Mary. She had already, the same year, mourned the death of her mother, the Regent of Scotland, whose life was wearied out in vain attempts to crush the Reformation in that land, and now she was an orphan, and suddenly a widow, and a stranger in the beloved country of her adoption, her education, her short reign. Catherine triumphantly resumed her power as guardian of the new king, Francis's brother, and banished Mary's uncles from their influential stations at court. The Queen of Scots retired to a private country residence, and there relieved her sorrow for her lost husband, in tears or in sweet poetry composed to his memory. Monarch still of her native mountains and valleys, and only eighteen years of age, her hand was sought by princes and kings, but she would entertain none of their offers until she had decided her course of life. This was too apparent to be doubted. Her brother Lord James, on behalf of the Protestants, and John Leslie, in the interest of the Catholics, came from Scotland to secure her favor for their respective parties, and to hasten her return to the home of her infancy. To each of the delegates she replied in a reserved and prudent manner, a characteristic that should have weight in judging her of her subsequent alleged intimacy with the notorious Earl of Bothwell, who it is noteworthy at this period came to France with other noblemen to greet their sovereign. Previous to embarking, Mary, as the custom was, sent word to Elizabeth of England, asking permission to pass through her dominions. 
Elizabeth replied through her ambassador that she would give a pass only on condition that Mary would no more refuse to sign the rejected article of a former treaty, which was a relinquishment of all claim to the English crown. Mary's refusal of this repeated demand, as well as her reply to other messages touching her religious position, are preserved at full length, and are beautiful exhibitions of gentleness and candor, on the one hand firmness, dignity, and intelligence on the other. These answers added to the personal charms and Catholic predilections of the one who uttered them so incensed the homely, bitter, and ambitious spinster who wore the British diadem that she began anew to excite the Scots against their sovereign and her own cousin, and sent out a fleet ostensibly to capture pirates, but really to intercept and seize that sovereign and relative on her voyage home. In August 1561, she set sail from France, having lingered for months to wean her heart, if possible, from that sunny land and to overcome her very natural dread of the country of her parents' past and her own anticipated trials. The French court accompanied her to Calais, the port of departure. Catherine, forgetting her jealousies, took an affectionate leave of her sad daughter-in-law and a few noblemen connections and literary men set sail with her who had been the light of the palace the pride of blood and the theme of song two historians and a poet chatelot afterwards a miserable actor in this narrative were of the company as mary ships weighed anchor another in an attempt to make the port was wrecked before her weeping eyes and declared by her to be an evil omen to the last moment of twilight she sat on deck gazing in steadfast despair at the home of her childhood and the kingdom of her splendid nuptials tears fell unceasingly from her and her lips constantly murmured farewell france farewell my beloved country when the night hid the shore she gave way to louder lamentation exclaiming the darkness now brooding over france is like that in my heart and then refusing to enter the cabin she slept on deck awaiting the dawn's earliest light when her attendants had promised to wake her a heavy fog delayed the vessels and at morning she saw again the dear fading hills and wept freshly saying farewell beloved france i shall never never see you more on the voyage she composed a famous song which is desecrated by any attempt to translate it into english verse and is literally this adieu pleasant land of france O oh, my country the most dear which nourished my infancy adieu france adieu my happy days the ship which sunders my friendships has only a part of me one part remains with thee that is thine i trust it to thy affection and for this do thou remember the other the sweetness of the french words and rhymes as in the pool ma patrie of the marseilles hymn the very prepositions to an english ear give the language a mournful effect. The young poet Ellsworth exquisitely conveys the spirit of the scene without reference to the words of the original song in these lines. Wooed in the may day of my prime and won by love to warmer earth, how can I seek in Scotia's clime again alone a sullen hearth? But France is now for other eyes and unto me are other skies. Oh, never shall a ship convey a sadder wanderer away. Behind the shore, distinct and bright, extends a farewell arm to me. Before me is the drooping light, the sunset and the misty sea. And thus in gloom and doubt decays to me the light of glorious days. When love to France with Francis flew, adieu, adieu, ami, adieu. The ships propelled by sails or oars according as the wind blew or not and built with high prows and sterns like the ancient galleys reached Scotland August 20th, 1561. On the way, a heavy mist alone prevented a capture by the English cruisers, who, as it was, found and seized one of the vessels containing Mary's furniture. A dense fog, like that which shrouded the French coast, and likewise interpreted as an evil sign by the Queen, misled her mariners so that they were nearly wrecked on the rocks of the Scottish shore. The disheartened Mary declared that she had no wish to escape wreck, or the chains of English imprisonment, so cheerless seemed her future residence in the stern land of her fathers. The voyage had been conducted with enough secrecy to surprise the Scots by the sudden arrival of their admired Queen. 
They were wholly unprepared to do fitting honor to the occasion, but were delighted with the return of their renowned ruler, especially with the fact that she so trusted them as to appear with no armed escort. Forthwith the population of Edinburgh arrayed themselves according to their trades along their road to the port of Leith, and horses poor in breed and array compared with the superb ones Mary had been accustomed to see were brought to receive the royal party. Shouts of applause rent the air, bonfires and illuminations shone everywhere, and after the newcomers had been established in Holyrood Palace, all the musicians in the city made the whole night hideous with inharmonious sounds, among which a party of covenanters, too strict to play on profane instruments, and too loyal to be silent, mingled their loud hymns. Knox, the great yet violent reformer, records that, so soon as ever her French felix, fiddlers, and others of that kind got the house alone, there might be seen skipping not very comely for honest women. Her common talk was in secret, that she saw nothing in Scotland but gravity, which was altogether repugnant to her nature, for she was brought up in joyeux cité. The intolerance which the reformers in those times had learned from the papists themselves was singly illustrated the next Sunday after Mary's arrival. She had announced her intention to be present at High Mass in the chapel of Holyrood House. This ceremony the Protestants had forbidden throughout the realm, and now they assembled in great numbers and would have rushed into the assembly to expel the priests, had not Lord James himself, a Protestant, stood at the door and quieted the tumult. On the next Sunday Knox thundered from his pulpit against the idolatries of Rome, but he himself had not become so enlightened as to inveigh also against the grand banquet given on the same holy day by the city to the queen at Edinburgh Castle, on her way to which she was grieved, as on many other occasions, by public exhibitions and ridicule of her religion. It speaks volumes in her praise that she manifested through all her life a liberality and moderation quite in contrast with the spirit of all religious parties in that age. She conceded so far indeed as to invite into her presence the great reformer, who had not concealed his opposition to her, and though in his mistaken conscientiousness, to use the most charitable word, he uttered disrespectful and indelicate language in her ears, she was no less calm and forbearing than shrewd and ready in her replies. This scene, as well as the mob at Holyrood Chapel, has been worthily painted by American artist Leutz and Rothermel. The Privy Council soon formed was made up of the great earls of both parties, and whose musical names, as handed down in their proud titles, are familiar to all readers of Scottish history and poetry. Lord James, who is now made Earl of Mar and afterwards Earl of Murray, a handsome, stern, sagacious man of thirty-one years, stood highest in the government, and exerted the most influence over the Queen on the one hand, and the new church on the other. He and others in power are accused of paying deference to the secret plottings of Elizabeth of England, who thus made trouble for Mary unceasingly, but could not turn that tide of popular admiration for her person, not her faith, which followed her everywhere. She journeyed about this time with her lords and ladies to the palace of Linlithgow and Stirling Castle. The scenes of her infancy and to other palaces among them Falkland, where her father had died. At Stirling she had a narrow escape from death, her bed having caught fire from a candle, and at Perth she fainted at the shocking means taken by the crowd to show that their enthusiastic loyalty did not imply any complacency toward her belief. The tour was made on horseback, there being but one wheeled vehicle in the realm, a chariot brought from England by Mary's grandmother, which would have been useless without better roads than there were than anywhere to be found. On her return to the capital, the young queen, still in her nineteenth year, was further provoked by a city proclamation, classing the papist clergy with outcasts of society, and expelling them from the town, under pain of carting through the town, burning on the cheek, and perpetual banishment. The French nobles and courtiers who had accompanied Mary to Scotland were quite disgusted by all these savage proceedings as they deemed them, and one after another left the country. Many suitors now sent their envoys to propose a marriage with the royal widow. Among them were Don Carlos of Spain, Archduke Charles of Austria, the King of Sweden, the Duke of Ferreira, and the Prince of Conde. Two Scotsmen of rank added themselves to these, the Earl of Arran, 
the partly insane son of the regent of that name in Mary's infancy, and Sir John Gordon, a man of noble appearance, and the second son of Earl Huntley, who was leader of the Romish army. There is no evidence that she favored the addresses of the latter, the former she certainly disliked, and all the more on account of a report that he had conspired to seize the queen and carry her to Dumbarton Castle, whereby great alarm was excited at Holyrood. It was a turbulent period, and no sooner had this fear been allayed than a party of base noblemen led by Bothwell assaulted the horse of a merchant, whose daughter was supposed to be intimate with Auden. The offense was repeated notwithstanding the queen's rebuke. A great mob was occasioned, which was dispersed and Bothwell disgraced by the court. A more serious disturbance followed on the heels of this. The Earl of Auden, through timidity or remorse, disclosed a plot of himself, his father, together with Bothwell, Huntley, and his son Lord Gordon, to shoot Lord James while hunting with the Queen. The motive was alleged to be a fear that the royal heirship of the Hamiltons, of which family was Auden, would be set aside and a desire to give the Catholics greater influence in the government. Whether the story of the half-crazy Annan were wholly true or not, he and Bothwell were arrested. But inasmuch as so many of rank are implicated and so little proof could be found against them, the Queen was contented to take possession of Dumbarton and hold Bothwell in prison. From this he escaped and remained abroad two years. No man is either wholly an angel or a demon and this plausible attempt at his very life may explain something of the young Lord James's subsequent wicked, merciless, and successful scheme to extinguish Huntley, a scheme strangely prefaced by the sumptuous festivities and humanizing joys of his own marriage with a daughter of the Earl of Marshall. This occurred in February 1562. In August, the iniquitous plan was executed. The Earl of Huntley was the most powerful baron in the north of Scotland. He had been a devoted and honored friend of Mary's father and mother, and to the last breath evinced himself a high-minded and faithful subject to herself. But Lord James, who had already affected the downfall of the Hamiltons and others who stood in the way of his unscrupulous ambition, was determined to ruin the Earl, and the Protestants generally, from less personal motives, had long wished such a result. Lord James was in reality king and marry his deceived instrument. From her he had secured the earldom of Mar, the benefits of which had hitherto accrued to Huntley, and now he privately obtained a grant of the revenues and title of the earldom of Murray, which were decreed for a term of years to the family of Huntley. The first step was sufficiently exasperating to the old northern baron, who did not suspect that such a second step had been taken but an affray brought on by the question of this latter earldom happened between two members of the family in the streets of Edinburgh. This gave occasion to James to persecute one of the actors in the affray. Sir John Gordon and thus offended his father, Earl Huntley, still more deeply. He next prevailed on the Queen to make a tour through her dominions, including the estates of the Earl, and there he sought both to alarm her with the falsely reported treason of Huntley, and to so beard the lion in his den by slights and injuries for which Mary should seem responsible, that he would be driven to rebellion. The Earl and his heroic wife in various ways proved their loyalty, but he was at last forced to an unequal encounter with James's troops, and nobly refused to fly, was taken and fell dead from his horse, so great was his indignant grief at the manifest overthrow of himself and his ancient house. The faithful, brave heart of the old man was broken, and he was no more. Yet James, now openly Earl of Murray, pursued his unrelenting ambition and vengeance. He procured the death warrant of the son, John Gordon, who was beheaded before the Queen's eyes. She wept and fainted as the axe descended on her former admired suitor, against whom history writes no blame. The other son she would not condemn to death, though he would have fallen a victim had not a forged death warrant prepared by James, Earl of Murray, been detected in season. He lived to recover the castles and estates of his father, which were now, by all this triumphant course of villainy, in the hands of Murray and his adherents. Mary is to be blamed only as a woman too honest to suspect so stupendous plots, and as one unfortunate in her period and position. Perhaps she failed to assert her better discernment and feelings. She had as much intelligence and tenderness as she had that manly courage which led her to scorn all supposed danger 
and on the same infernal expedition, to regret that she was not a man to know what life it was to lie all night in the fields, or to walk upon the causeway, with a jack and knapsack, a Glasgow buckler, and a broadsword. But she was deluded by the seeming austere integrity of her half-brother, this Lord James, Earl of Murray. Nor was it her only misfortune to blindly aid his aspiring designs. She was thus also exposing herself to the machinations of Queen Elizabeth, with whom Murray maintained a most detestable and traitorous understanding. Evidently, he would have stopped short of nothing between himself and his sister's crown, and possibly he made his reckless course a matter of piety for the same papacy which he opposed had taught him, as it has taught others in all times, the satanic doctrine that the end sanctifies the means. After these exciting scenes, two years of peace to Mary and her kingdom ensued. Her quiet was, however, invaded by the presumption of a French poet of fortune and family, Chatelard, who was one of her numerous escorts to Scotland, and who now went thither again to urge the suit of his patron, the Duke of Danville. He was pleasing, accomplished, and a grand nephew of Chevalier Bayard. The queen, being fond of poetry, and not averse to the customary glowing compliments of courtiers, received his laudatory effusions with favor, and even replied to them in verse. In this she was no doubt culpable. She could have gratified and encouraged his poetic nature, and yet have kept him at a suitable distance, until the danger or safety of his temperament was fully apparent. Her whole life was a training to discretion, while his vocation was to give free flow to feeling and impulse. He introduced himself into her bedchamber, was discovered and ejected with a severe rebuke, but soon after repeated the offence, when Mary called Murray to her assistance, and Chatelard was seized, tried, and executed. On the scaffold he looked toward her window and exclaimed, Farewell, loveliest and most cruel princess whom the world contains. Nothing but a blind zeal, or mere malignity, can accuse the queen of more than imprudence in this sad affair. Chatelard merited his fate. During these two years of peace, Knox also continued to annoy Mary by his irritating personalities and preaching, his seditious opposition, and his bitter remarks when admitted to her presence. For the most part, he may have acted from a mistaken sense of duty, but he too often exhibited the strange mixture of artfulness with conscientiousness, peculiar to his nation, to be set down as a blundering zealot. Much is to be pardoned to his times, yet, in the queen herself, he had an example of calm charity even in that day of persecution. Mary endeavored to conciliate him by gentle words. Nevertheless, after she had opened her first parliament with a befitting display of royalty, he and his brethren denounced in public the superfluity of clothes and vanity of their sovereign and her ladies. And Knox boldly attacked her governmental acts, because they were not in form, as well as substance, what he desired. Called to an interview with her, he threw her into excessive weeping by his blunt severity until she could abide his presence no longer. She saw him but once more, and then he was on trial for treason, a few weeks subsequently to the audience granted him. Two rioters, out of many who had been disturbing the services at Holyrood Chapel, were imprisoned and Knox to save them, wrote letters to all the leaders of his party, in order to assemble a crowd that would terrify the magistrates into an acquittal of the rioters. This was a treasonable infraction of an express law recently passed, but the reformer was pronounced innocent by the Protestant majority of the royal council. Such were the winds that frequently ruffled the serenity of Mary's life during the two years of lull that preceded her stormier days. She spent this time in journeying through the western and southern parts of Scotland and making a second progress through the wilder north. Her ordinary life was varied by the duties of her office and every study and amusement that could adorn her gifts. Rising before light in the morning, her first hours were given to her privy council, before whose august members she sat, needlework in hand, giving and receiving advice. She was a great lover of history and the classics, in the reading of which, especially the works of Livy, she passed an hour or two each day after dinner. For the study of geography and astronomy, she had the advantage of the first globes ever introduced into Scotland. End of section 28 Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Nine of the Heroines of History. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 3. Gardens were her delight, and were attached to her six chief palaces of residence. Hollywood had two, but not satisfied with so limited exercise as these afforded, she often walked to Arthur's seat, or along the Salisbury crags which overlook Edinburgh. The indoor confinement varied only by short slow walks abroad, which is the greatest curse of American women, never enfeebled Mary's strength, or paled her bright cheek. In the fresh air she practiced with the crossbow, or rode, hopped, and hunted, or walked miles together like her later countrywomen. At home she danced, sang, played on the lute and virginal, or assisted in the masks that were customary. One of these is described. At a feast during the first course, a cupid entered and sang Italian verses, accompanied by a chorus. During the second course, a young maiden sang Latin verses. At the third, a person in the character of Father Time appeared and offered his parting advice. The queen had always at hand a company of musicians who sang or played the viol, lute, and organ. To her chapel music she added, strangely enough, a military band with bagpipes and drums. Elizabeth of England had an endless wardrobe, but Mary's, though rich, was not extravagant. We are told that her common wearing gowns, as long as she continued in mourning, which was till the day of her second marriage, were either made of camlet or demise, or serge of Florence, bordered with black velvet. Her riding habits were mostly of serge of Florence, stiffened in the neck and body with buckram and trimmed with lace and ribbons. In the matter of shoes and stockings, she seems to have been remarkably well supplied. She had thirty-six pair of velvet shoes, laced with gold, silver, and silk, and three pair woven of worsted of Guernsey. Silk stockings were then a rarity. The first pair worn in England were sent as a present from France to Elizabeth. Six pair of gloves of worsted of Guernsey are also mentioned in the catalogue still existing of Mary's wardrobe. She was fond of tapestry and had the walls of her chambers hung with the richest specimens of it she could bring from France. She had not much plate, but she had a profusion of rare and valuable jewels. Her cloth of gold, her turkey carpets, her beds and coverlids, her tablecloths, her crystal, her chairs and footstools, covered with velvet and garnished with fringes, were all celebrated in the gossiping chronicles of the day. Indeed, Mary's reign was a new era of refinement and politeness in wild, rough Scotland. Her sweet manners and charming conversation and cultivated tastes soon elevated the tone of her court to that of any European capital. We know not how much the present culture and elegance of the land of Wilson and Macaulay are due to the influence of Mary, nor with all her expensive tastes did she forget the duties of charity. To all the poor she was a mother, herself directing the education of many poor children, and often personally watching the courts, where she maintained a lawyer to defend those who could not pay an advocate. Two priests also were employed by her to distribute alms constantly to all the needy. In the year 1565, Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, went from England to Scotland, and with his advent commenced the great troubles of the Queen of Scots. Elizabeth had already begun her course of premeditated mischief in the matter of Mary's marriage, having insultingly proposed her own polluted favorite, Dudley, whom she had made Earl, as a husband for a pure-blooded and pure-minded sovereign, and knowing the offer would be rejected. Mary had declined many proposed alliances with the most powerful princes of the continent, in spirit of kind concession to England. She now turned her thoughts to her cousin Darnley, who next to her was heir presumptive to Elizabeth's crown, whenever it should be vacated by death. And the English queen, guessing the intention, not only permitted Darnley to go, but recommended him to Mary's favor, in order that she might interfere afterwards and break off the match by a civil war in Scotland. In this she overshot her mark as the event proved, though it would have been well for our heroine if the attempt to foil her purpose had succeeded. Darnley was four years younger than Mary, who was now a little more than twenty-two. Though so young he was mature in his appearance, being uncommonly tall and well-proportioned. His features were regular, his movements graceful, his address winning, and his presence altogether full of fascination. 
In his childhood, he had displayed a precocious mind, as a letter still preserved and a story written of his, spoken of, may testify. His mother had always been ambitious to have this match take place. His father, the Earl of Lennox, as before mentioned, had been banished from Scotland and his estates confiscated. He was now reinstated in his forfeited honours, and his son Darnley, following him, reached Weems Castle near Edinburgh, on the north shore of the Frith of Forth, where Mary was then sojourning. She had every reason of policy for accepting him. She found him, as she remarked, the lustiest and best proportioned long man she had seen. He behaved well on first acquaintance, and he exhibited the accomplishments and professed the taste that might win her regard. Never was there a prospect of more fitting and happy union. He could not conceal entirely his boyish opinions and rash arrogancy, but these were naturally imputed to his youth. He courted the reform party. The nobles generally welcomed with gladness any one who would supplant Murray in authority, and Darnley's mother had taken care to send presents. To the queen a ring with a fair diamond, one emerald to my lord of Murray, one or loge or montre watch, set with diamonds and rubies to the secretary of Lethington, a ring with a ruby to my brother Sir Robert, for she was still in good hope that her son, my lord Darnley, should come better speed than the Earl of Leicester, anent the marriage with the queen. But more favorable to his suit than diamonds were the measles and ague that opportunely attacked this long man and demanded Mary's nursing care and excited in her that pity which is akin to love. When her mind was fully made up, she first intimated it to Darnley, who, unlike the modern Prince Albert, had not awaited a queen's proposal, and of course was silenced until she offered herself. Next, she sought the concurrence of her good cousin Elizabeth, who forthwith refused it in peremptory terms. Mary replied that she had only made known her independent intention as an act of courtesy, and did not beg any consent. Elizabeth proceeded to excite the discontent of Mary's subjects, particularly Murray, and having imprisoned Darnley's mother, commanded himself and his father to return to England. Lennox made answer that the heir of England did not agree with his health, and his son more plainly sent word that he considered himself subject to Mary's word alone. But the trouble which Elizabeth had been brewing began to develop itself. The leading nobles of the Scottish court openly opposed the marriage, and Murray commenced in good earnest to set a rebellion on foot with the purpose of seizing his sovereign's person and himself assuming the government. She was in company with her intended husband to attend the baptism of a child of Lord Livingston. The conspiring lords were to waylay her on the road she was to travel, but she learned the plot in season to provide a powerful escort and to pass by the ambush so early that her enemies were unprepared to intercept her. Another attempt to provoke disturbance was made at Edinburgh, under the cloak of religion. It was frustrated, however, by the timely arrival and activity of the Queen. Next, on the 17th of July, Murray and his accessories boldly proclaimed civil war at Stirling Castle, and sent to England for money. Mary's wisdom, courage, and diligence now shone forth in her measures to meet this rebellion. Her nature was one that difficulties brought out in its strength instead of overpowering it. Her administration had been mild and acceptable. The majority of the people were attached to her, and many men of rank rallied around her in this emergency. But to anticipate any unforeseen calamity and to take away the excuse for treasonable acts, she hastened to consummate her union with Darnley. The marriage was solemnized on Sunday, July 29, 1565, in the Holyrood Chapel. According to the Catholic ceremony, John Sinclair, Bishop of Brecon, officiating. It was generally remarked, says Bell, that a handsomer couple had never been seen in Scotland. Mary was now twenty-three, and at the very height of her beauty, and Darnley, though only nineteen, was of a more manly person and appearance than his age could have indicated. The festivities were certainly not such as had attended the Queen's first marriage, for the elegancies of life were not understood in Scotland as in France. And besides, it was a time of trouble when armed men were obliged to stand round the altar. Nevertheless, all due observances and rejoicings lent a dignity to the occasion. Mary, in a flowing robe of black, with a wide mourning hood, was led into the chapel by the earls of Lennox and Ethel who, having conducted her to the altar, retired to bring in the bridegroom. 
the bishop having united them in the presence of a great attendance of lords and ladies, three rings were put on the queen's finger, the middle one a rich diamond. They then knelt together, and many prayers were said over them. At the conclusion, Darnley kissed his bride, and as he did not himself profess the Catholic faith, left her till she should hear Mass. She was afterwards followed by most of the company to her own apartments, where she laid aside her sable garments, to intimate that henceforth, as wife of another, she would forget the grief occasioned by the loss of her first husband. In observance of old custom, as many of the lords as could approach near enough were permitted to assist in unrobing her by taking out a pin. She was then committed to her ladies, who having attired her with becoming splendor, brought her to the ballroom where there was great cheer and dancing till dinner time. At dinner Darnley appeared in his royal robes, and after a great flourish of trumpets, largest was proclaimed among the multitude who surrounded the palace. The earls of Athol, Morton, and Crawford attended the queen as sewer, carver, and cupbearer, and the earls of Eglinton, Cassillis, and Glencairn performed the like offices for Darnley. When dinner was over, the dancing was renewed till supper time, soon after which the company retired for the night. Further messages were now exchanged between the neighboring queens, resulting only in further display of the envious hypocrisy of the one and the straightforward intelligence of the other. Mary's honeymoon was full of vexatious diplomacy and military preparations. The earls Bothwell and Sutherland were of necessity recalled from banishment, and Lord Gordon recovered the titles and possessions wrested from his father by the grasping Murray. The queen appointed a new provost at Edinburgh in place of the unreliable one, and summoning her subjects to arms marched to Linlithgow, to Stirling, and to Glasgow, her forces accumulating at every step. Murray, with an army of twelve hundred, was at Paisley, five miles from Glasgow, but fearing an encounter hastened to Edinburgh, there to find that his selfish motives were well known, and hardly one person ready to assist him. Thither the royal army, now numbering five thousand, returned in pursuit, and Murray hurried at its approach back to the vicinity of Glasgow, whither the Queen again marched so immediately that Murray retired to the southern border where through the English Earl of Bedford he received three thousand pounds and three hundred men from Elizabeth, with brazen deceit, had just assured Mary of her good will. The latter put forth a proclamation in which the real designs of Murray were set forth in plain words. Eighteen thousand soldiers soon gathered to her aid. The rebels fled from their approach and finally dispersed, leaving their leaders to take refuge in England. For a long time Elizabeth did not permit Murray to come into her presence and at last made him and the abbot of Kilwinning, on their knees, and in the presence of the French and Spanish ambassadors, declare that she herself had taken no part in the Scottish rebellion. To such degradation were the traitors compelled, instead of reaping their expected reward. After this they lived at Newcastle for some time in want and neglect. In this campaign the Queen of Scots by common consent exhibited great executive talent and admirable spirit. She rode with her officers in a suit of light armor carrying pistols at her saddle-bow, and Knox himself confesses that her courage was manlike and always increasing. The revolt thus suppressed was but the prelude of Mary's henceforth uninterrupted misfortunes, all of which flowed chiefly from her ill-starred marriage. Darnley soon manifested a nature too gross and defective to bear his sudden elevation to power. He gave loose to intemperate and libidinous inclinations, and to his willful temper. His manner towards his wife was often cruelly rude. His time was given to riotous companions, and the kingly title and equal power conferred on him by the generous love of the queen, together with many other favors, only fed his childish appetite for more, until he determined to usurp the supreme authority. The Earl of Morton, who effected allegiance, to the queen, was ready to seize on the passions of her husband as instruments for the execution of his own purposes, which must be considered selfish ones for the most part, inasmuch as Mary's whole course, and all historical documents, evince no design in her to join the Continental League of Princes for the suppression of Protestantism by fire and sword. But she was resolved at a parliament soon to meet, to secure the final expatriation of that Murray who, in the face of her offers of pardon, had persisted in rebellion, and had long shown himself a faithless and ungrateful dissembler. This resolution stirred up the disaffected to immediate action. 
Morton and others at once conspired with Darnley and the absent Murray, in a way that seemed to favor the separate interests of all concerned. The king was to be clothed with the right over the queen, Murray was to be restored, and the reform party to have full sway. Thus was Darnley made a poor dupe, and bound by written agreement to go to any extreme, even as the language of the compact evidently implied, to the wresting of liberty or life from his devoted wife and munificent queen. The first step in this treason was the infamous murder of Rizzio, the confidential secretary and faithful adviser of Mary. There is some proof that this was perpetrated not merely through jealousy of Rizzio's long influence with the queen, but more immediately in revenge of his disclosure of this same plot, which it is affirmed, he had accidentally overheard as one that purposed her imprisonment until the rebels secured their objects. Rizzio was a native of Piedmont and came to Scotland in 1561 as an attaché of the Savoyan embassy. He was retained by Mary on account of his musical talent, and three years after rose to be her French secretary. Advanced in years and repulsive in features, he was accomplished in mind and manners, and in various ways serviceable to his mistress. She could trust no man, not even her husband, and though two of her four Marys yet remained unmarried with her, it is not wonderful that she admitted the trusty Rizzio to a familiar companionship, which has given some false color to the indubitably false insinuations of her enemies. Besides these, it was reported that the Italian was a paid agent of the Pope, a report that would make his assassination a popular scene in the drama of iniquity to be acted by the traitors. Saturday, the 9th of March, 1566, was fixed upon for the deed of blood. Morton introduced into Holyrood Palace five hundred armed men as a safeguard. Lord Ruthven, a fierce man, and encased in a coat of mail beneath his robe, led a chosen few to Darnley's room, directly beneath a small private room where Mary was at supper, in company with a brother, a countess, and the secretary. By a secret stairway that led to this room from the lower one, Darnley, at eight o'clock, entered and sat down at the supper table next to the queen. His not returning after a certain interval was a preconcerted sign that his accomplices could do their work. Accordingly, as many as could crowd into the small chamber suddenly appeared, one after another, their savage leader clanking his armor as he sat down without a word of salutation. Mary demanded an explanation. Ruthven declared that no evil was meant except to the villain near her, and fixed his ghastly eyes on the secretary, who was conspicuous in his dress of satin, velvet, damask, fur, and jewels. Mary heard the reply with calm courage, and called on Darnley to maintain her rights. Then seeing him move not, she commanded the intruders to leave, saying that Parliament should investigate any charges against Rizzio. Ruthven now assailed the latter with a storm of invective, until, frightened from his senses, he rushed into the recess of a window behind the person of the queen, and cried repeatedly in Italian, Justice! Justice! In the confusion that followed, the table was overturned, all the lights but one extinguished, and swords and pistols flourished at random. At last, George Douglas grasped Darnley's dirk, and leaning over the queen struck Rizzio, who was dragged out into the presence chamber, dispatched with fifty-six stabs, and afterwards thrown down the great stairway, with the king's weapon still in his side. Several noblemen then in the palace were to have been captured, but they managed to escape by ropes from the windows and arouse the provost of the city. The alarm bell was sounded, hundreds of citizens ran to the palace, and called for the queen to show herself and convince them of her welfare. She was forcibly kept back, and Darnley dismissed the crowd. To her presence Ruthven returned, and there drank a glass of wine, and to her rebuke for his conduct replied in abusive words. All night she was held captive, suffering the while from illness brought on by terror and her condition as almost a mother. Next day Parliament was prorogued in Darnley's name, and in the evening Murray and the exiled noblemen arrived at the palace. The affair had succeeded but how the queen should be disposed of was a perplexing question. To set her at liberty, or put her to death, were equally dangerous, and to imprison her almost as much so. Darnley began to entertain misgivings, and at his entreaty the party agreed that Mary should be released, provided she would pardon all concerned. Alone with him, her strong mind and heart soon overpowered his feelings, and he consented to escape with her at midnight, and fly to Dunbar Castle for their common safety against the lawless nobles who befriended in order to ruin him. 
there her still loyal earls rallied around her and at her return with a sudden collected army they fled for their lives she now found it advisable to pardon murray and the leaders of the former rebellion and to confine her indignation to the recent evildoers her whole reign it has been said was a series of plottings and pardons she became very melancholy as well she might be for various reasons her conjugal love had been betrayed none of her associates were to be relied on and elizabeth still pursued her malevolent schemes one of which was the sending of a man to mary's court who passed himself off as a romish priest deputed by english catholics to offer her the crown of their country he proved to be an emissary of elizabeth herself who had the face to demand his capture his real character had already been discovered and he was arrested in a way his mistress dreamed not of end of section 29 recording by stacy cologne fort worth texas Thirty of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part Four. In June of this year, fifteen sixty-six, the Queen gave birth to a son who afterwards became James I of England, being the first sovereign who united the scepters of that country and Scotland. In him were Mary's double title, and many hopes realized, though not until after her death, and alas, after that tender infant over whom she now watched, when grown a young man, had repudiated in stinging words his own mother in her sad captivity. The birth was a great matter of public rejoicing, the celebration continued long, the people, both high and low degree, assembling in solemn thanksgiving. The infant had an earl for governor, and his lady for governess, and was kept at Stirling Castle. Six months after, the child, remarkable for health and strength, was there baptized with extraordinary pomp. Ambassadors from all the chief courts of Europe came to attend the ceremony. Sixty thousand dollars were levied to defray the cost of their entertainment, and of the occasion. Queen Elizabeth sent a font of gold worth five thousand dollars, and the baptism was duly performed after the Catholic ritual. The christened name was Charles James, James Charles, Prince and Steward of Scotland, Duke of Rothesey, Earl of Carrick, Lord of the Isles, and Baron of Renfrew. Among many other provisions made for the royal babe, five ladies of rank were appointed rockers of his cradle. And though he as yet could taste milk only, he had a master cook, a foreman, and three other servitors, and one for his pantry, one for his wine, and two for his ale cellar. As a specimen of the presents given by Mary in honor of the event, may be mentioned a chain of diamonds worth three thousand dollars given to the Duke of Bedford, Elizabeth's ambassador. The most exciting scenes in the life of Mary had already begun to rapidly unfold themselves. All that occurred so far, is but the first breath of a tempest. After the affair of Rizzio, Darnley found himself more than ever despised and slighted by the nobility. Nor had he the cunning or the care to hide his resentment from them. He shunned the society of almost every one, accompanying the queen only a part of the time on her journeys after her confinement, and, for the rest, wandering restlessly from one place to another. Through all these months his wife maintained the same kind manner to him, and paid him indeed all the more attention as a rebuke to the contemptuous lords, and he had the nobleness to recognize this in a marked way, and by declaring always that he had no complaint to make against her. He formed, or pretended, a plan to leave Scotland for the continent. This may have been done to extort some concessions of power from her, when she was so sick with fever and convulsions, two months before the christening that all hope of her recovery was given up, he was by her side, having flown to her at the first news of her serious illness. And when, immediately on her recovery, the proposal to divorce Darnley was made, at the instigation of Bothwell, by her counsel, she instantly rejected the idea from personal choice as well as for reasons of state. This proposal was the first step in the bold and terrible part which Bothwell played. It led to the scenes of horror that which history has few greater, 
that Earl was now in his thirty-sixth year, and but nine months before had married Lady Jane Gordon, sister of the Earl of Huntley. The plan to effect a divorce between the Queen and the King was the first sign of the purpose he had evidently formed to wear a crown himself as the husband of Mary. Never was a design more daring in itself or in its execution. He so addressed himself to the selfish interests of the barons that he secured their active or tacit support to any extremity or procedure against Darnley, still keeping his own ulterior purpose disguised. The king's death was resolved upon, or assented to, by all the chiefs. At this crisis, Darnley was taken ill at Glasgow with the smallpox. It has been asserted, with much improbability, that it was poison rather than disease. The queen, full of sympathy and alarm, went immediately to take care of him. She found him recovering, and returned with him in a vehicle to Edinburgh. From the nature of his infectious disease, or from his aversion to the presence of the lords, he was lodged in a house adjoining the southern wall of the city, and called Kirk in the Field. It had four rooms, of which an upper one was occupied by Darnley, and the one immediately beneath it by Mary, who spent much of her time and often slept there. She sat for hours by her husband's bed, and occasionally entertained him with the songs and instrumental music of her band. Little did the Queen or Darnley dream of the volcano preparing beneath their feet during the ten days they passed together in that house. We may imagine him subdued by sickness, to calm thought and gentle feeling, and her renewing the ardor of first love to her handsome and wayward lover in commiseration for his calamities. And well may he be an object of pity to all men. He was but a boy of nineteen when wedded to a queen and raised to a kingly power that half maddened his naturally strong will. Now he was aged twenty years only, and his heroic wife was but twenty-four. Men of age and wisdom had in every way endeavored to estrange the hearts of these two fair young beings, and were now busily plotting the destruction of one or both. Bothwell lost no time. On Sunday night, the ninth of February, 1567, the Queen was to attend the marriage of two of her favorite servants at Holyrood, and thus would not be at the Kirk in the Field. Duplicate keys of the house had been obtained. Eight men were enlisted to do the deed. As the best plan to avoid recognition and detection, powder had been brought from Dunbar Castle two days before. With this, the house was to be blown up. There was of so great quantity that the men went twice with horses to transport it. The queen and three earls were in Darnley's room while it was carried into her room beneath, and Bothwell himself, after overseeing the inhuman work, joined the party in the sick man's chamber, so self-possessed and fearless was he. In the conversation there, it is said that Mary remarked, It was just about that time last year David Rizzio was killed, a chance word that might well have made the bold earl visibly shrink. At eleven o'clock she affectionately kissed her youthful husband, unconscious that she would never hear his voice again, then left with the others to attend the wedding. As she entered Holyrood House, she detected the smell of gunpowder in a passing servant of Bothwell and asked what it meant. An evasive answer was given, and she said no more. Bothwell joined the dancing and masking party, then went to his own house and exchanged his silver-embroidered doublet of black satin for coarse dress and cloak. With his accomplices, he hurried to the scene of action, affixed a piece of lint to the powder, which lay in a heap on the floor, and lighting the train, hastened to a garden close at hand to await the catastrophe. For fifteen minutes all was silent, and Bothwell, was with difficulty restrained from going to examine the lighted match. But his patience was needed no longer. Suddenly the city echoed as with many thunders in one, and shook as with an earthquake. The doomed building was shivered to pieces. Stones, ten feet in length and four in breadth, it is affirmed, were found blown from the house a far way. Bothwell made all speed through by-streets for his lodgings and retired to bed. In half an hour the news came to him that the king was killed. He donned the same dress he had worn in the presence of the queen a few hours before, and assuming great anger went with the others to break the news to Mary, who was already distressed to know certainly of the rumor that had reached her. At daybreak the guilty lords went to the scene, where they found a crowd gathered. One servant was rescued alive from the ruins. Three others were killed, one of whom, together with Darnley, was found at a great distance, both dead, but with hardly a wound. 
Thus perished Henry Stuart, who bore the titles of Lord Darnley, Duke of Albany, and King of Scotland, after a reign, if it may be called such, of eighteen months. Young, imprudent, willful, and vicious, yet fascinating and accomplished, his union with Mary and his shocking death have attached to his name a lasting interest. The unhappy queen shut herself up and refused to see any one. Her account of the event in a letter to her ambassador at Paris is on record, and is full of unaffected grief and horror. Believing that violence was intended to herself also, she removed to Edinburgh Castle for greater safety. Great rewards were offered for the detection of the murderers. Suspicion soon centered on Bothwell. At night, a placard was posted, charging the deed on him together with others, not accepting the Queen as one who connived at the crime. The whole country was agitated with mystery. Mary used every exertion to penetrate it, but she knew not whom to arrest, and was so worn out with trouble that she was prevailed on to journey for her health. According to the entreaty of Lennox, Darnley's father, she finally ordered a trial of Bothwell in April. At this, Bothwell was acquitted, having taken care to make it unsafe for Lennox to appear and support the charge, even if he could have found evidence to sustain it. Bothwell's next achievement was the procuring of a written bond signed by nearly all the nobility of every party and creed, pledging their lives and goods to aid his claims to Mary's hand. This was accomplished at a supper to which he invited them on the 20th of April. It must have required much preliminary electioneering, and as proof of very bold and subtle finesse, or perhaps the lords readily assented in order to better ruin Mary. The bond was secured for its effects on the Queen at a future day, and for the present was kept from her knowledge. When questioned as to the report of her intended marriage with the Earl, she said there was no such thing in her mind, and when Bothwell soon after hinted his desire to her, she discouraged it altogether. The time had come, therefore, for another high-handed act. The Queen had been spending a few days at Stirling, and was to return on the 24th of April. Bothwell gathered a band of cavalry, numbering between five hundred and a thousand men, as if to suppress disturbances on the southern border over which he ruled. But changing his course after proceeding a short distance, he intercepted Mary and her slender escort at Linlithgow, took the bride of her horse, and hastened to Dunbar Castle. An abduction at all, under the circumstances, together with the unnecessary number of troopers employed and the spirit of Mary's whole life and testimony, are some of the evidences that this affair was not with her knowledge or consent as has been maintained. Able writers have not only laboriously accused her of this, but have argued that she had already a criminal intimacy with Bothwell, and that too before the murder of her husband. All that we know of her on undisputed record and a great variety of circumstances that any reader of history may gather utterly disprove the foul insinuations and assaults of partisan or blind writers. At Dunbar Castle on the rocky seashore, Mary was held ten days in a solitude to which none but Bothwell was admitted, not even her own servants. She saw no signs of an attempt by her subjects to deliver her. She found the nobles were pledged on the Earl's side. He both supplicated her love and tender appeals, and declared that he would compel her to marry him against her will if necessary. Darnley, though only three months in his grave, had been one of the murderers of her faithful servant and secretary, and had before forfeited her love, so that she must have felt his death a relief, though a great shock to her sensibilities. There was not a man of influence except her captor on whom she could rely. Her kingdom was full of trouble and violence. Bothwell was a man of shrewd mind, unflinching courage, and great energy. He had been acquitted at his trial, and had the written consent of all the peers to his marriage with her. He was that sort of fierce lover which her whole temperament would lead her to admire and yield to. She was not a shrinking maiden, and above all, she was wholly in his power with no prospect of escape. What wonder she at last consented to be his bride, or that, having once consented and received his fond attentions, she afterwards, under less apparent necessity, adhered to her promise. But there is reason to believe that he went to the most guilty extremities of compulsion, so that her course subsequently became one of mere necessity. Meantime, he and his injured wife both sued for a divorce, which was hurriedly granted by the courts. Taken under guard to Edinburgh Castle, which was in Bothwell's control, Mary was not permitted to appear in public until the bans of marriage had been twice proclaimed. The ceremony took place in a very quiet way, 
and according to the Protestant form, to which the Queen seems to have been reconciled only by a despairing state of mind, so unfaltering was her steadfastness and her peculiar faith through a whole life. A sermon was preached on the occasion, and after it at supper Bothwell gave loose to his coarse hilarity elated by his entire success. But his success so far was no less complete than was the conscious ruin of the Queen of Scots. So hopeless was she, it is declared, that she threatened to commit suicide. Though she was reinstated in Holyrood Palace, she was continually guarded by two hundred harquebusiers in the pay of her ravisher. His conduct to her was full of suspicion and rudeness. His other wife, formerly divorced, remained in his former residence, and, as it was believed, had an understanding with him. And to these sources of Mary's misery were added the now apparently confirmed and triumphant accusations of many of her subjects, and a loss of the respect of other nations and royal courts. Villainy ever overacts its part. Bothwell might have confirmed his triumph by a prudent course, but in his proud exultation he took no care to allay the already active envy of the nobles, and he even boasted that if he could get Mary's child into his possession, the young prince would never have an opportunity to revenge the death of his father. Soon after, he proclaimed his intention to go with the queen to quell some troubles on the border, and called on the chiefs to appear with their forces under arms for this purpose. It was at once suspected that he had designs on the young prince at Stirling Castle. Accordingly, the prince's lords, as they were thenceforth termed, gathered their retainers as if in compliance with the call, but assembled at Stirling in great numbers in open opposition to Bothwell. He just then learned that he could not rely on the keeper of the castle of Edinburgh, and fearing an attack from that quarter also, with the ready apprehension of an evil conscience, retired to Borthwick Castle seven miles south of the city. No sooner had he placed Mary there and collected all his force in defense than he found himself surrounded by the swarming army of his adversaries. At night he fled through their ranks, in company with Mary, whose fortunes were now thoroughly involved with his, and who thus escaped in the disguise of male attire. Arrived at Dunbar, he summoned all the Queen's lieges to her name to appear for her defense. An army of two thousand men, moved by feeling of loyalty, answered the call and were led forth by himself and Mary. The opposing forces met at Carberry Hill, but neither seemed disposed to engage the other in battle. The day was spent in negotiations, at one time for peace, at another for a decision by single combat, Bothwell having challenged any man of his own rank to meet him, and each party claiming that the other was in blame for the failure of this proposal. Finally, the Queen offered to place herself in the hands of her lords, and to pardon their seeming revolt, provided they would ensure her free sovereignty. To frustrate her purpose, Bothwell, with characteristic desperation, attempted to shoot her messenger, and not succeeding, retired angrily to Dunbar Castle with his few followers. The moment Mary surrendered herself to the nobles, for the sake, as she said, of saving the waste of Christian blood and her people's lives, was a turning point of his rash career. Not long after, he found it advisable to escape into the north of Scotland, where he held estates as a Duke of Orkney. Pursued thither by his enemies, and nearly captured as he was flying from them in a boat, it is related that he remained a while in the Orkney Isles, committing piracy on the seas, and was at last taken to Denmark, or else voluntarily went thither, to enlist the Danish king in his wretched cause. However that may be, it is believed he spent years in a Danish dungeon, and at last died insane, from the mad chafing of his proud, restless spirit, and the gnawings of conscience. His life was strange and wild as a dream. He was an embodiment of the fiery passions of the age. In our times, noblemen are giving scientific lectures to the people, or sitting as chairman of peace conventions and missionary societies. Mary's conduct to Carberry Hill can hardly be construed into any real love for Bothwell. Her army was so superior in numbers and position as to promise a sure victory. She would not have prevented a battle or parted from him in such a manner had she not desired to put herself out of his power. But her noble trust in her base nobleman was destined to be betrayed. As she entered the city, she was preceded by a banner, whereupon was painted the shocking picture of Darnley lying dead, and her child kneeling before it with the words, Judge and revenge my cause, O Lord. The populace pressed around her, 
and insulted her with the most shameful exclamations while she rode on, her face bowed down in tears. To her surprise, the lords let her past Holyrood. She called out all her loyal subjects to interfere on her behalf, but she was taken to the provost's house. The next day, she so worked upon the variable sympathies of the crowd that her oppressors escorted her to the palace. This was but a feint of submission, or rather a step to a greater outrage. At midnight, Ruthven and Lindsay, the grim earls who were active in Rizzio's assassination, aroused her from sleep, disguised her in a coarse riding dress, and placing her on a horse, made all speed through the darkness until morning, when she found herself at Lochleven Castle, which was situated on a small island in the lake of that name north of Edinburgh. This was a place of great security, and the more so in this case, as it was, the seat of Lady Douglas, the mother of Earl Murray, and closely connected with Lindsay and Morton, all of them at heart, the foes of Mary. The full extent of the designs against her was hidden from the unfortunate queen. It was represented that extreme care for her safety in view of the power of Bothwell was the reason for such treatment, but she could not doubt that some evil was intended. Her keeper, the Lady of Lochleven, as she was more generally known, behaved harshly to her charge, and even taunted her with a pretension to the crown itself. She was kept, too, in close confinement. Her rooms occupying a bastion that overhung the waters of the lake are still shown to travelers, though dilapidated, like the rest of the castle. Thus far, the dominant party had not dared to publicly charge her with crime. Their declarations show that she was universally regarded as a helpless victim of the Lord of Dunbar Castle. Two great parties, however, soon began to define themselves, one for the Queen and one for the Prince. Morton, the leader of the latter, was at Edinburgh with his supporters. Hamilton Palace near Glasgow was a rendezvous of the Queen's friends, among whom were Huntley, Argyll, Rose, Livingston, and Seton, altogether representing a majority of the kingdom. The prince's friends, as they termed themselves, began to publish many systematic falsehoods criminating Mary, and these have been repeated and urged ever since. Their motives are plain. They hoped by dethroning her both to escape punishment for their misdeeds and to rise into greater power. And the queen's friends, knowing this, proposed that they should liberate her on condition that she would forever pardon them. But they had gone too far to consent to this. Elizabeth, too, was busily instigating them against Mary, and Murray, who had long been at Paris, cautiously watched events in Scotland, lent them his encouragement. End of section 30. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas. Section 31 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Cologne. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Mary of Scotland, Part 5. The 26th of July, 1567, was perhaps the saddest of all the sad days of this hapless queen. Sir Robert Melville and Lord Lindsay came to make her abdicate her throne. Melville first saw her, and used his persuasive talent to the utmost, but without effect. The savage Lindsay was next admitted. He at once broke forth in fierce threats, vowing to the unprotected queen that if she did not immediately sign the papers of abdication brought with them, he would sign them with her blood and cast her into the lake beneath the window. Mary had known his sanguinary part in the Rizzio tragedy. She now saw him about to draw his dagger, as she supposed. Melville adroitly whispered to her that acts done under compulsion would not be binding if she ever should choose to disown them. In an agony of tears and terror, she put her name to the documents, wherein she was made to say that she freely resigned her crown, being wearied with the labors of government. Thus, did this woman, whose honorable ambition was her ruling passion, suddenly find herself no more a sovereign. Four days afterward her son James, then one year old, was crowned at Stirling. All commands were published in his name. Buchanan, one of Mary's bitterest enemies, was made his tutor, and from that time contempt for his own mother was carefully instilled into the child's mind. Murray soon returned to Scotland. 
with characteristic circumspection he did not at first commit himself to either party the regency during james's minority was urged upon him he went to lochleven and counterfeiting great sympathy for mary prevailed on her to approve his assuming that office for her sake at edinburgh he pretended much humility and a regret that the choice had fallen upon him but took the oaths of regent he set himself energetically and carefully at work to suppress discontent and to strengthen his power for a virtual reign in james's name that promised to endure many years and to make assurance doubly sure love letters were now forged and produced purporting to be from mary to bothwell and implicating her in darnley's murder the summit of his ambition appeared to be attained when mary a light-hearted girl of eighteen in sunny france received the respectful visits of her scottish earls little did she foresee how strangely the dark threads of the lives of the two of them were to be interwoven with the fair fibres of her own for the first seven months of her imprisonment the gloom of the poor queen was unalleviated by one ray of hope in four short months an unparalleled series of misfortunes wrongs and insults had fallen upon her the lady of lochleven a former dismissed courtesan of her father was bitter and malicious one of the chief servants of the castle was concerned in rizzio's death and declared he would gladly kill the queen her own servants were her only solace and protection these were faithful and tender yet even with their aid she had no chance of escape but in March, 1568, a new light shone into her prison. A son of the lady keeper, George Douglas, aged 25, and a relative of the family, William Douglas, 17 years old, had entertained a very romantic interest in the beautiful and luckless Mary. They now arranged a plan for her escape. She clothed herself in the garments of her laundress, concealing her face, and bundle in hand, passed out of the castle and took the boat in waiting. But, the boatmen discovered her delicate hands, and, despite her commands as their queen, took her back to the castle. The resolute and chivalric George and William did not relinquish the idea of rescuing their lovely sovereign. Five weeks after, another scheme was formed, and this time successfully carried out. On the 2nd of May, William abstracted the keys of the castle from the family supper table where they had been laid, locked the whole household in as he passed out, helped Mary out of the one window into a boat prepared for her, threw the keys into the lake, and with the assistance of Mary herself at the oars, soon placed her exultingly in the hands of several of her trusty lords who were waiting with the guard to receive her. Quickly mounting and riding rapidly with little rest, they arrived with her at Hamilton Palace early in the forenoon of the next day. The whole land was aroused by the news of her escape. Multitudes of every grade gathered to her assistance among them nine earls nine bishops eighteen lords and many barons and gentlemen six thousand soldiers were at her command before the week closed she renounced her forced abdication melville himself appearing and testifying to the circumstances murray's friends began to silently withdraw from him he was at glasgow near the headquarters of mary he saw the need of instant action to arrest her intention to fortify herself in dumbarton castle which is situated on a lofty pyramid of rock, and was a place of impregnable strength. She was already on the way with her troops. Murray called together some four thousand men and met the Queen's army at Langside, two miles south of Glasgow. Both armies endeavored to gain a commanding hill. Murray, by the advice of a veteran, mounted his infantry behind the troopers' saddles and reached the point first. A fierce battle ensued for a long time doubtful, but at last decided by a reinforcement of Highlanders in favor of the regent. Mary watched the scene in unimaginable excitement, and overwhelmed at the result cried out that it were better for her not to have been born. There was no time for delay. With a few attendants, she put her excellent horsemanship to full proof, and never paused until she was sixty miles away to the south at the Abbey of Dundrennan. She was advised to sail for France, but was too proud to enter as a fugitive the land she had reigned over in splendor as the queen of a triple scepter. Nor would it do for her to apply for aid to a Catholic country. It would hazard her crown too much. She trusted that Elizabeth would at least give her refuge and applied for it. 
Unable to wait for a reply, she made her way by land and water to the vicinity of the castle of Carlisle in England. Men of rank came to meet her and conducted her with great respect to the castle. Elizabeth sent hypocritical messages of sympathy. She privately exulted in the climax of her wishes, the apparent ruin of Mary. She did not know how far it was prudent to take advantage of her power and waited to consult with Murray. With the excuse that Mary was in danger from her Scottish enemies, the castle was repaired. She at all times kept under guard, and her walks and rides finally prevented altogether. For the same ostensible reason, she was not long after removed farther south to Bolton Castle in the north of Yorkshire. Elizabeth's course was soon settled. She conferred with Murray, who had dispersed the renewed gatherings of forces in Mary's cause, and busily entrenched himself in his ill-gotten authority. The plan was to bring the Queen of Scots to what amounted to a criminal trial, and by foul means make her stand condemned before the world. She was called on to appoint commissioners to meet those of Murray, and others named by Elizabeth, to settle all disputes between her and the regent. Against this she protested as a sovereign, who could not be placed on a level with rebels to herself, but was ultimately persuaded to thus vindicate her honor. The English queen, from first to last, acted with a cunning as fiendish in its subtlety as in its malice. The commissioners met at York on the 4th of October, 1568. Notwithstanding Murray's utmost efforts, the case seemed to be going against him. Elizabeth, to give her influence a more deadly certainty, removed the conference to Westminster, and received Murray to her presence, whereas she had cruelly and unjustly refused to see Mary, the royal defendant, as if her pretended purity could not come in contact with one on whom rested suspicions which Elizabeth herself, after the mock trial even, declared to Mary she did not believe. With her quick intelligence and decision, Mary instructed her commissioners to withdraw from the council, and thus dissolve it, because it was so evidently unfair to adjourn it to a great distance from the accused, and to admit the accusers to opportunities denied to herself. Before this order reached her friends, Murray had, as a last resort, brought forward the forged love letters and sonnets ascribed to Mary, and involving her in the death of Darnley. The evidences for their suspiciousness need not be recounted the way they were used and at other times neglected to be used by the usurpers of the queen's power is enough to brand them as false the conference was broken up but murray and his spinster dictator arranged a little scene in which he was reprimanded and in defence brought forward an elaborate written statement of charges and proofs which england might employ in various ways and a reply to which was denied reception thus the whole infamous plot did not succeed but the great point was sufficiently gained, namely, to so overshadow the character of one of the earth's noblest and purest heroines that she could be held in lingering captivity. The retribution that followed the perfidious actors in this history is remarkable. Murray did not long enjoy his success. He was shot by Hamilton in revenge of maddening injuries done to the family of the latter by the troops of the former, and the tears Mary shed for him were witness to some good in his character, but more to the lofty magnanimity of her own. Lennox and Morton, who succeeded him, and other participants in the same events, after covering themselves with crime or cruelty or treachery one by one met a violent death. They that took the sword perished by the sword. Mary was but twenty-five when she entered England, in the first full bloom of body and mind. She was doomed to a thraldom of eighteen years that gradually destroyed her spirits and health, and ended in the bloody vengeance of the axe. This portion of her life was as much more heroic than the days of her active achievements, as the virtues of endurance and resignation are more noble than executive talent. She ceased to be the acknowledged Queen of Scotland, but she gained the kingdom of her own ambitious and afflicted heart, and she was purified like gold tried in the fire for the kingdom of heaven. She was taken from one castle to another and committed to the charge of one lord after another, in order that she might neither gain too much influence over her keepers nor carry out a plan of escape. Her luxuries, comforts, attendants, and friends were continually diminished through the relentless hatred of her oppressor and her communications with friends at a distance was intercepted as far as possible. 
She employed herself in embroidery, reading, and writing. Some of her poetical efforts are preserved, and are beautiful memorials of her genius, her grief, and her Christian faith. And well did she need all resources to beguile her weary days and make her forget a while her discomfort. She had gradually ceased to be remembered, and her strong party at home was by degrees suppressed and thinned by death. Her hair turned prematurely gray with sorrow, her strength, from want of exercise, miserable fare, and bad accommodations failed her. A painful symptom of disease in her left side began to grow upon her. She thus describes her residence at Tutbury in 1680. This edifice, detached from the walls about twenty feet, is sunk so low that the rampart of earth behind the wall is level with the highest part of the building, so that here the sun can never penetrate. Neither does any pure air ever visit this habitation, on which descend drizzling damps and eternal fogs, to such excess that not an article of furniture can be placed beneath the roof but in four days it becomes covered with green mold. I leave you to judge in what manner such humidity must act upon the human frame, and to say everything in one word, the apartments are in general more like dungeons for the vilest criminals than suited to persons of a station far inferior to mine. Inasmuch as I do not believe there is a lord or gentleman or even yeoman in the kingdom who would patiently endure the penance of living in so wretched a habitation. With regard to accommodation, I have for my own person but two miserable little chambers, so intensely cold during the night that but for the ramparts and entrenchments of tapestry and curtains, it would be impossible to prolong my existence. And for those who have set up with me during my illness, not one has escaped malady. For taking air and exercise I have but a quarter of an acre behind the stables. To aggravate her miseries, a poor priest of her faith was hung before her window. These accounts are translated from her letters in French. She who is the glory of the Louvre and the pride of Holyrood was at last the neglected prisoner of a decaying hunting lodge in the midst of an English forest. Many conspiracies were formed and attempts made to release her and restore her to her throne. The chief of these was by the Duke of Norfolk, an English noble and the most powerful subject in Europe. He proposed secretly for Mary's hand and was assured that Though on general ground she was averse to another marriage, yet she would favor his project and his suit. For this he was on discovery in prison nine months in the Tower of London. When released, he set about his scheme with all the more determination. Spain and Rome were to aid his cause, the Duke of Alva to land with an army, the English Catholics to rise, and the government to be overturned. But a second discovery of his purpose sent him to the block. He died like a hero. Mary disclaimed all knowledge of his treasonable designs toward Elizabeth, though she admitted his efforts to release herself, and she was not therefore made to suffer on his account. Simple devotion to a lovely and suffering queen, and private ambition were not the only causes of disquiet in England. From whatever motive trouble was made, it inevitably seized upon Mary's fame as its rallying word. Hence, an association of nobles was formed and sanctioned by Parliament for the purpose of prosecuting to death any person for whom, as well as by whom, any movement against the government was set on foot. Never was there a more absurdly unjust course of procedure adopted. It became a law and soon had occasion of execution against its real object, the Queen of Scots. In 1586, a new conspiracy was headed by Anthony Babington, a young man of wealth in Derbyshire who had heard much of Mary while he was at Paris. He was to be aided in the same manner as the Duke of Norfolk. Some letters passed between him and Mary, but there is no evidence of her initiation into the treasonable part of the plan. It was discovered. Fourteen of the leaders were executed, six of whom were pledged to assassinate the English Queen. Before the news had reached Mary, she was officially informed that she was to be held to trial as an accomplice. The nation was so greatly excited that Elizabeth saw that she might prudently go to any extremity against her admired prisoner. Mary denied the jurisdiction of another monarch over her, but as before, she was persuaded to submit to trial, lest a refusal be a tacit acknowledgment of guilt. The mockery of a court was held at Fotheringay Castle. In its great hall, with much pomp, 
the daughter of a hundred kings appeared worn out with confinement and grief but still resolute calm and discerning before the greatest lawyers and politicians of the realm and so ably answered their arguments that on the testimony of her enemies who described the scene she confounded her prosecutors the old artifice was again used the court was adjourned to a distance from her at westminster and there of course she was condemned the shameless tyrant of England made a great show of reluctance to sign the death warrant, and waited to see what effect the verdict would have abroad. The King of France interposed feebly. The King of Scotland would have saved his mother, but was falsely counseled, and too timid, though now nineteen years of age. The warrant was signed, and the man to whom it was given was subsequently imprisoned for life on the hypocritical plea that he had received royal instructions not to have it executed. And the man who was the keeper of the doomed victim was enjoined by Elizabeth to secretly murder his prisoner before the sentence could be carried into effect, but he declined the wickedness. His name is Sir Amias Paulette. Mary requested that her servants might witness her constancy in death, and that her body might be buried according to the rites of her church, or carried to France. But no reply is known to have been made. On the afternoon of the 7th of February, 1587, the earls who were to carry out the sentence reached Mary's prison at Fotheringay. They respectfully disclosed their business. She heard them calmly as they read the death warrant. She expressed a cheerful willingness to die and made solemn oath on the Bible that she was innocent of the charge for which she was to suffer. She inquired about her son, and the conditions of things abroad concerning which she had been kept in ignorance. When she found that the execution was to take place at eight o'clock the next morning, she manifested some emotion, but soon regained her serenity. From the first, however, her attendants, consisting of six waiting maids, a physician, surgeon, apothecary, and four male servants, were extremely agitated and when the lords retired, made great lamentations. She knelt with them and prayed. At supper, the last repast with her household, she ate lightly, conversed but little, looked smilingly, and drank the health of all around her, calling them by name. Then she carefully disposed of all her money, furniture, and jewels, forgetting none of her friends near her or at a distance. After this, she wrote letters and her will, which occupied two large sheets, and is a fine memento of her strong and lucid intellect and of her noble heart. At two o'clock in the morning, she retired to her bed, and rose at daybreak, gathered her little company of adherents, and continued in prayer, until a knock at the door announced the fated hour. No priest was allowed her, her attendants were forbidden to see her die, but on further entreaty four males and two females of these were permitted to accompany her. To Melville, the chief of her train, she said, weeping, Tell my son that I thought of him in my last moments, and that I have never yielded either in word or deed to aught that might lead to his prejudice. Desire him to preserve the memory of his unfortunate parent, and may he be a thousand times more happy and more prosperous than she has been. She perished in the room that had been the scene of her trial. A scaffold, carpeted with black, was at one end, and on it were two English earls and the executioners. Thither she was led, Melville bearing the train of her royal robe. She was dressed in state. She wore a gown of black silk bordered with crimson velvet, over which was a satin mantle. A long veil of white crepe stiffened with wire and edged with rich lace hung down almost to the ground. Round her neck was suspended an ivory crucifix. The ruins of her former stately and blooming self, she was still beautiful and dignified. The warrant of death was read aloud. She trembled not, nor changed her sublime tranquility of countenance. The Dean of Peterborough stepped forth from the two hundred spectators and soldiers and began to lecture her on points of doctrine. She turned from him, knelt, and prayed aloud for her enemies and for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Rising, her veil and necklace were removed. The cross she was about to give to Jane Kennedy, but the executioner snatched it away as part of his customary spoils. Her eyes were bound with a gold-embroidered handkerchief, her head laid on the block, and from her lips breathed the words, O Lord in Thee, 
have I hoped, and into thy hands I commit my spirit. Three awkward blows of the axe severed her neck. Her head was held up to the gaze of the dumb crowd. The executioner cried, God save Elizabeth, Queen of England. The Earl of Kent responded, Thus perish all her enemies. Her remains were left rolled up in old green bays taken from a billiard table, afterwards buried with display in the Peterborough Cathedral, and finally a quarter of a century afterward placed in a splendid tomb at Westminster Abbey by her son James who removed every vestige of the scene of her trial and death, Fotheringay Castle. Mary reached the age of forty-five years. Her active life was between the ages of sixteen and twenty-five. No queen ever possessed higher talents or virtues. Her faults were the noble ones of a warm, trustful heart and of ardent youth. She confided in the treacherous too often. She had not learned that there are always many persons utterly dead to every claim of reason, honor, and generosity. Reigning in maturer years, she would have vindicated her commanding intellect. As her enemies were often detestable in the face of their truer belief, so was she tolerant, deeply religious, and grandly upright in spite of her superstitious creed. Her character was frank and beautifully proportionate. Never would mere brilliancy of person and of mind have excited such glowing friendships, such bitter envies, such lasting admiration, and worldwide sympathy. End of section 31. Recording by Stacy Cologne, Fort Worth, Texas.